Can you say and spell your complete name? Um, you mean you want the first name spelled too? Mm -hmm. H-A-R-O-L-D, and I have to use the middle initial E because somebody else has the same name. Uh, Willits, W-I-L-L-I-T-S. Very good. And your unit in the 10th Mountain Division? I was in the 86th Regiment uh, F Company and also in uh, E Company of the 90th. Oh, interesting. That's, that was another regiment. And okay. And what was the highest rank served in the 10th? Uh, sergeant. Okay. And the year that you entered the 10th Mountain Division? Uh, it was March 11th, 1943. Okay. Um, I'm going to start by having you tell me um, a little bit about what it was like to be in the 90th. Well, I was in the 86th from the very beginning uh, when they first felt brought us into Camp Hale. And uh, I stayed for, uh, went through basic, and at about five months or five and a half months, I, I interviewed for the mountain training group. I wanted to get in that group, but all of a sudden I'm home on a furlough. And when I came back, I was assigned to a cadre from the 85th and the 86th to form the uh, 90th Regiment and we were helping them to, uh, to do their basic and what have you. And I stayed in there was through the winter of 43, 44, and uh, went through all the winter training up there on uh, Cooper Hill and, and many maneuvers and what have you. And of course they broke up the 90th when the 87th came back from Kiska and back to Camp Hale. And then now we had the 85th and 86th and 87th Regiment. Didn't the 90th have a lot of Norwegians in it? No. No, that was the 99th, I think, that came there and went and left to go back to Italy prior to our ever getting around to it. Uh, did you interview uh, Gordy Dick? Uh, no. Okay, Gordy was one of those that got into that, mm. that, that was, and was in Italy be, sometime before we got there. Um, I have to tell you, you're, I'd like to have you tell me a little bit about being over at Liverno and uh, the mine explosion that was actually one of the earliest casualties in the war. Maybe you could tell me about that okay. from your point of view. Were well, you there? Yes, we, we were uh, in the 86th, of course, the first regiment to get to Italy. And uh, we landed in Naples and had Christmas and then they shipped us on up to Livorno by a small freighter and my company went from there on south of the town and set up camp and put out guards. But the first truck to go south to a portable shower, I was fortunate to get on it because we needed it at that time. And, uh, and when I got back, all this calamity had already happened. They stepped on a, uh, one of these uh, bouncing Betsy's, we called them. You stepped on them. And when you stepped off, it came up behind your head and went off. And um, this was all my company. Did you hear it go off? No, no, I was still at the shower when this mm -hmm. took place. So when I got back, uh, we had many casualties, both uh, dead and injured. And my very good friend, uh, uh, Sergeant Hart, was sitting, was being smart and stayed up on the embankment, but caught a piece of shrapnel in his abdominal area and didn't make it. And so I was, you know, kind of, uh, that was the hardest for me. The other fellows were in other parts of the uh, company, and I knew who they were, but... Uh, was it a little shocking to see the realities of war up close? And we weren't even up to the line by quite a distance. You know, the, the, the line was still quite a ways from us. The Arno River was the borderline coming out there near Livorno. And we moved from there on up to Pisa and spent a little time in what they call the King's Row. You've been on that place? and uh, climbed, you won't, well, you won't tell believe. Me, tell me a little bit about how unexpected that was and how did you feel about that? You know, you weren't even on the line yet and here you already had casualty of yeah. war. Were you surprised? You know that we were, we were the 10th, that was the first casualties in Italy of the, sec, of the whole division. And uh, yes, very surprised to have it happen. And uh, 
I, I, for some reason in my life, I never had seen a dead person in my life. But uh, I, of course, didn't have this morbid curiosity, so I didn't go wandering around afraid to, you know, that they would set off some more of these darn mines. But uh, yeah, it was a shocker, and uh, so we we had um, had to get get a grip on ourselves to uh, tell us that hey, we're approaching war, and this is what we expect. And uh, tell me a little bit about any early patrolling that you did before the Reaver Ridge operation. Okay, well, they moved us from. Um, from that area up onto the line. I don't remember the names of all these little bergs and places, but we were right up against the the southern extremity of the Apennines, right where it came down into the, the Arno Valley, the Arno River there. And we went on uh, patrols. The snow was two or three feet deep. It was a uh, little bit on the spring side there, but uh, uh, the Germans held the heights and we would send patrols out at night. Did you go on any patrols? Oh, many times. Tell me uh, about some of the patrols you went on. Well, I, I remember several of them that uh, when we were carrying this ammo and uh, especially the guy with the BAR, the Browning Automatic, uh, had to carry a lot of ammo because it was a high rate of speed uh, of, uh, firing. And um, it, um, these guys would get weighed down with these bandoliers, so some of us that were a little on the stronger side were ta unloading these people, but because of that nature, it bogged us down because of the condition and everything. We never ran into the Germans, but other patrols did while we were in that area. Um, did you wear snowshoes or skis? No. Mm -mm. You were able to walk? No, we just stomped in the snow and followed the next guy in front of us. Now, because you were on Reaver Ridge and you were 86F, that means you went up route number five, I'd like you to recount for me, as much as you can, everything that you remember about going up about the Reaver Ridge operation and your route. Okay, well, after we left uh, the uh, southern part of the uh, Apennines, we traveled up and we approached Vitachotico at night. And there was the Germans were lobbing shells in the general area, but we got into the, the village and spent that night and the next day until the next evening. And then we took off under the dark and we went all the way up, uh, what's the name of the river that? Dardania. Dardania. We, we followed that around, clear up to where it went against the mountain into, uh, there were some buildings there that had been shelled out but we climbed into these things because we were told not to be, it, nobody could see us during the daytime. And the next day we actually could see the Germans walking outside of that outpost on top of Reaver Ridge. And so we stayed undercover. And then uh, late in the next, that evening, when it got dark again, and uh, we got together and moved our way down to the river and crossed it. And we all got our feet wet because the methods of going across didn't work. And this is ice and snow, mind you. And then we were standing around at the bottom of the, uh, of this wall and the, the lieutenant was supposed to have been able to, in fact, he was showing a trail back there when, when the, uh, the Italians took him out and showed these trails to the different officers. But he couldn't find it because it was fog and nothing but total confusion. We couldn't find the trail. So this is where uh, we old climbers, uh, Weir Stewart, uh, Danny Phillips, and myself, and a few others that uh, really enjoyed our mountains and climbing, we decided, well, we weren't going to get up to that ridge 2,000 feet away if we didn't do something. So we just took over. and. Uh, and we we started scrambling around trying to find a way up this this thing, and we moved around and finally after a little scattering and uh, what have you, uh, Danny, with all the equipment we had in the United States, well, we had nothing. They they brought nothing with us. We were just a bunch of GIs, and uh, so we uh, Danny got a rope from an Italian. That was the only rope we had for this group to climb this thing. And we had no pitons, no hammers, <laughs> nothing like that. So could you, could you have used those things? Oh, heavens yes. Uh, 
the way the the way the valley was, the wall was pretty much like this, and then there was an area that you got to the top of the wall, and then it was like this, and the Germans sat up here. Well, any noise we made here, they it was subdued. They didn't hear it. So we could have pounded pitons into the rock wall and what have you, but we didn't have them. So what we did with that rope was that well, I was... What kind of shoes did you have? Sorry. Just regular GI shoes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Were you a little surprised that you'd done all this great training with great equipment in the U.S. and you get here and you suddenly got nothing? Not very, not totally. The word wouldn't be surprised. We were angry. <laughs> they gave us a job which we were trained for uh, without the equipment that we were trained with. And so uh, we, did, we just, uh, because we were uh, doing our part, we had to get up on top of that ridge to coordinate the, the attack with all of the other people down the line in the 1st Battalion. Tell me a little bit about what was F Company's specific role being out there on the farthest ridge, the farthest route. How was F Company going to support the other companies? Well, they were all outposts and they were all communicated with each other and with the artillery because they were looking down on the back side, on our side of Belvedere. And that's why the first, you know, that there was two other attempts to take Belvedere and they were beat off because the Germans had everything uh, zeroed in, plus the people on, their people on Reber Ridge was looking right down on their backs. But you guys had a, a particularly important role because you were out protecting the flanks, isn't that true? Well, uh, the main thing was was to get rid of all those outposts off of Reaver Ridge. In other words, get rid of the guy looking at your back. And that's what we did. And, uh, was that F Company's particular charge? Yes. For that furthest outpost on, on Reaver Ridge up against the mountain, 1st uh, Battalion had the other four places, uh, outposts below us. And where there was actually a cabin up there, and I think there were six or eight uh, of the Germans uh, in the in the outpost, but they uh, didn't think anybody was going to climb that thing, and so we took them totally by surprise. What was it like when you came up, pushed over the ridge? Well, uh, uh, Pete Cyber and I were out all by ourselves <laughs> because the other ones were still below on that. You know, they had tied the rope up, brought the guys up because Danny Phillips and Stewart did a fantastic job of organizing these guys to get them up and I was trying to find a way to get up there and we got up over the top of this wall and started up where those trees were growing and it was a little bit easier to go and um, so uh, Pete Seibert and I decided we weren't going to fight the war by ourselves so we went back and got the rest of them up over the edge and we approached the top of the ridge in a fog, we could not see anything, and the snow was about three or four feet deep, and there was passageways the Germans had dug into the snow on the ridge to get to their outpost. And we found some of this, but apparently uh, the way we figured it is that somebody hit a tripwire or something that told the people in the cabin that there was somebody out there. And so they come out and opened up with a machine gun and in our general direction. But of course, they had the disadvantage of the fog too. And uh, we had enough people up there that uh, we returned fire in that direction and it scared the Germans right off the ridge. They took off. They just practically ran and <laughs> jumped off or took their skis and got down the other side. Did you go look at their bunker and see what was up in there? Oh, we, we used that thing. We went right into their nice, warm, little, cozy places, and, but there was too many of us to crowd into it, so we sort of took turns for a while. How many of you were there? I think the, uh, uh, there's been all kinds of things they keep talking about F Company. Well, there we were a, a group that were extracted from F Company, taken down in the, uh, the, way back before we got out of the, uh, the uh, southern part of the Apennines. And we were training. We were going up and, and attacking uh, home and doing all kinds of crazy things without knowing what our objective was. But it turned out to be this, this lookout on, on um, Reaver was, Ridge. Was it two platoons? Uh, How many platoons was I don't, it? I don't think there's any more than about 30 or so. Okay. 30, 30 to 35 is what I feel because I was on that mountain, on that face with them. And we, there was no way that they could have hidden 
a lot of people in those buildings. There weren't too many buildings down there that we had. I never did get somebody to tell me exactly uh, how many people were actually on that group, but uh, it wasn't a huge one. It wasn't a company. The company has over 200 people in it, so you weren't done. That didn't happen. Now, was your route difficult enough that mules were not an option? <laughs> no, no way. No mules, no option. No, no. Uh, was one of the goals of F Company to help carry up uh, howitzers or bigger guns that would that you could? No, in okay. in our position, I think probably the heaviest gun we carried was uh, was a BAR, okay. and. Uh, one of the guys hauled up a knee mortar. I don't know if you know what that is. It, it, you don't put it on your knee, you put it on the ground and you aim it this way. It just it's, it doesn't have all the fancy stuff with it. And it, we had some shells which we used to, um, we were, we all this took place right at the crack of dawn. We, everybody made it. That was the nice thing that all of these five positions hit their objectives and right at the same time, right at the crack of dawn, which made it good. Did you leave, did your company leave as one of the earlier groups? Oh, probably because we had the furthest distance to go. We, we hiked all the way to the end of the river practically and then the, the ridge was attached to the mountain right where we were. When you got up to the top and the Germans uh, were scared off, uh, what was your feeling about a counterattack? Did you expect a counterattack? Yeah, so yeah, we set out uh, outposts around the perimeter and would you believe that a uh, even with all the bang booming all along that ridge of the attack at that time, a patrol that was coming up to relieve this outpost walked right into us. They walked right into us on the river, on the ridge, and uh, they came out of some timber and uh, into a little open area and because this was our first combat, uh, apparently we had somebody that was a little bit on the quick on the trigger or something because we could have captured almost all of them, but we didn't. Somebody opened fire on the first one, killed him. And some, the one behind that got wounded and the other fellows were still in the woods, turned around and skied down out of there fast. And that was the only time we saw anything. We did see one patrol way off in the distance in the snow you could see these dark objects coming up and they were going up to relieve another outpost up on I guess that's Spigolino that's attached to isn't it and uh, that's the only one any kind of a counterattack. most of all of that took place down below where there was a road that went up onto the back of the of Reaver Ridge and uh, in the lower ones they had counterattacks because there were some more troops down there uh, we didn't have anything except that one relief patrol that what, came up. What was the most difficult part about the Reaver operate your experience in the Reaver Ridge operation? Well, it was done at night, cold, fog, snow and ice, and uh, 2,000 feet of mountain to climb in the night to get there by dawn. And uh, we succeeded in ours. Fortunately, we didn't have a lot of uh, counterattack. We did have artillery that was firing at us all the time and they either hit the ridge or it went over us and so we were uh, fairly safe. But uh, Sergeant Stewart and I, after we'd been up there and we're starting to, to go back to join our outfit again, we decided to go back down the way we came up because the, so many guys had, had, had lost equipment on the way up. Well, you're climbing on a rope and you got things hanging on you, you know. Uh, we found a rifle, we found knives, we found all kinds of food, <laughs> and we, we eventually got to the bottom and joined our outfit, and, uh, but... Uh, How long did it take you to climb up Reaver Ridge that night? Four well, hours, six hours, well, I guess? Well, I, I don't know what dawn was in those days. This is Febu end of February. Uh, we, we, we started out at 10 o'clock at night, and, and, we, and we got there at the crack of dawn. You figure it. So that was nonstop walking, climbing. Well, yeah. Well, searching to get find out whether we had a trail or not, and we didn't have a trail, so we had to make one. We were we were free climbing that whole ridge without without a trail at all. And with no knowledge of where the trail might be. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any idea. The lieutenant was was taken up there, and of course this is late at night and fog and cold and everything and. 
And he didn't know where it was, and he just kind of gave up, and we just couldn't wait, so we just took off. Who was your lieutenant? Uh, do, do I have to mention the name? No. No, we, we just kind of forget about him. <laughs> um, did he climb with you from behind? Uh, I, I guess he was he was uh, got into it once we got to going and we got the ropes and got everything so people could get up over it. And I guess he got up there. I I don't remember. <laughs> we were we were so busy we didn't have time. It must have been hard for him to lead if he didn't know the way. Well, yeah. Well, the, the trouble is I don't know. You know, our outfit when it was first formed, there were more more enlisted men teaching. Everybody, including the officers, skiing and mountaineering, because uh, the officers were trained for, you know, military training, and uh, they weren't outdoors people like the rest of us were. So we had to actually train a lot of those people. And so I think he was a southerner, and uh, therefore he came up out of a place that didn't even have mountains, probably. <laughs> How long did you stay up on River Ridge? I think it was only a day or two before uh, Weir and I took off and went back down again. I don't remember who else and what time the rest of them joined us, but we, we ended up in reserve. The 85th, 87th had already gone over Belvedere, and when we got down to where the battalion headquarters were and started to cross that area, of course the Germans decided to eliminate the battalion headquarters, and we passed right through it. And, and there was some pretty big heavy shelling going on and we kind of nestled up to the backside of, um, of Belvedere as reserve, but uh, the shrapnel was just flying all over the place from these large shells that were coming in. Were you able to see from the top of River Ridge all of the action unfold on, Re on Belvedere? Un unfortunately. What did you see? See, the, the, see, their attack was a night attack too, and we didn't see it until the next day before we come down off of Riva and we could see him bringing the bodies and the people back down off of Belvedere. We, could, we were looking right down on it like looking at a movie, and it wasn't too nice that we had to also pass through that area. When the Reaver Ridge operation, once you had attained your goal on Reaver Ridge, and the next night the Belvedere operation commenced, could you see the night operation, uh, could you see fire? Could well, see, see, they didn't, uh, the idea was uh, that attack was, uh, you, uh, don't, don't shoot. Put bayonets on your guns. You're going to do this in the dark. But once the shooting did start, could you see it? Yeah. Uh -huh. And what did it look like? Uh, just like the movies, <laughs> looking looking down on uh, just pins of light here and there and stuff like that, and shells going off. But pretty soon it became all smoky because of all the the shelling and everything. You couldn't see it. And I don't think there was any fog the next night. I don't remember that. I just remember when we were climbing. But uh, that um, that was interesting to be able to be a spectator and sit back and watch your people getting <laughs> getting killed on the other slope. It wasn't neat. What was the next big action that um, you experienced? Well, we just kept moving forward. Uh, over Hill and Dale, we remember we stopped a couple times because you can only go so far before you have to bring logistics back up to you, or else, you know, your 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 people are are gone down to two or three out of a bunch, and then they got to fill those back up uh, with uh, replacements and bring up ammo, food, and everything else. So they have to stop. You get too far out, and then that's why counterattacks succeed: is that they attack those few that are left out there. And so we, we stopped uh, two or three times going, uh, going to, towards the pole. But I remember uh, being on a, uh, a forward slope and we went on a patrol because we knew the Germans were in the bottom and, and we went down at the bottom to, and to, uh, to capture some Germans. And, and we laid on that wet, damp ground down there for an hour or two. <laughs> it wasn't too easy. And, and, uh, the patrol never came back, so we got back out of there. But while we were in this forward slope foxhole, every every day at a certain point in time, they were very uh, uh, systematic about th what they would do with things. The artillery would come in, and this other fellow and I in this foxhole, we could look out. We had to dig a, a ditch to get back over the ridge so they couldn't see us. 
and one of the 88 rounds hit right below us, but it was a dud, and it, it lifted us up and we came back down, but it didn't explode, so uh, <laughs> we would have probably been buried if it had a, but uh, I had a lot of close calls, but uh, as uh, I, I, in my story, I say I was in the right place at the right time. It seems like uh, whatever happened, I was in a safe place, apparently. But the last big jump off we say, had... Say, say that one more time. I was in the right... I was in the right place at the right time. And... Uh, the last big jump off? And the last jump off, we were uh, built up on this ridge, the whole mass, and all of the districts were up there, tanks were there and everything. And uh, I, I, I have a copy of the, what was the, what was the magazine we put out, or the... Blizzard? No, no, the one put out during the war. Com oh, ski -Zack. No, there was another, now you're, you're, you're back in the modern times. This was during the Second World War. Uh, oh. Famous, famous paper magazine they put out. You mean like Life magazine? Well, uh, it wasn't uh, wasn't from this country. It was one that we put out. The government. Uh, oh. oh boy, I'm. You mean I, like Stars and Stripes? I think it was Stars and Stripes. I have a copy of 1945 talking about the Tenth Mountain, showing a a, a a tank, and and I in 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 my real life was in a foxhole right beside this tank. Oh. And of course I didn't show up in the picture. They were interested in the tank. But the, the, we, um, oh, one of the events before we got there was when we uh, broke through a line. Uh, the Air Force always furnished us with shelling, bombs, and what have you. But they, they could only stay up so long as their fuel would last, and then they had to go back, and, then, and it was quite a ways back, like Rome or something like that, to get to an airport to replenish their fuel and their ammo. And by the time they got back this one time, we, were, we had moved quite a ways. We'd broken through and moved quite a ways, and when they come back, they came down and strafed us coming through a, a, up a highway, uh, going up into a, a, a pass, I believe it was. Can you move your hands this way so you don't cover the mic? Oh, okay. Can you recall um, which phase that was in, or roughly what month? I can't remember how far out. It would probably be, it was probably March, probably in the latter part of March or something like that, because we're about halfway to the Po Valley or less, and we, we had several people killed on that one, and that was, we were strafed by a P-47. I don't like to, because the Air Force were good guys and they really supported us, but everybody makes mistakes. Today's, today's world, the media makes too much of a fuss over these kind of things that happen in war. It happens. And uh, then we went on from there, and when we got to this one big line I was telling you about before we, the last one before we got to the pole. Well, wait, go back to, the, to that. Were you, did you observe it happening? No. Okay. No, I was off to one side, but uh, we, we know that the Air Force had come back and were doing their thing, but we heard that these, this happened over there. And uh, President Roosevelt what, died in April the 12th, did he not? Do you remember when he died? Oh, yeah. What we, do you remember thinking? We heard about it right away. Well, we were very sad because we figured that he was very important in this world we were fighting in and living in, and and uh, and but we were um, we I don't know what happened. We've been sitting on the line, but it, I don't think it was because of his death. We didn't do anything. It was uh, a day later, and we jumped off after the Air Force and the tanks and everybody had raised all kinds of havoc, and we only got about. Oh, I'd say a few hundred yards or a quarter of a mile or something down this slope, and we passed through a little open area. And about that time, the Germans opened up on us, and we thought we had kind of smoothed them out over there, but it didn't. They were dug in, so uh, uh, our my lieutenant got killed, and his ammo. I mean, his radio man got killed, and two or three other people were wounded right in front of me, and I was carrying the machine gun at that time because uh, my squad had been damaged to the point where I was the one, that, uh, I was the biggest one 
wanted to carry the machine gun, I guess. And um, and so I uh, uh, dropped down and loaded it up and fired at anything and everything I think that they could be hiding in, like smoke uh, uh, haystacks, buildings, and things like that, until some of the people could get back out of out of this open area. And uh, a couple of our our people laid out there for five, six hours, even after we moved off down the ridge and cleared of the valley and everything, and and uh, they couldn't get at them, so they uh, they uh, they were shooting artillery, and he got shot three times with bullets and one piece with a, one time with a piece of artillery. Were you feeling when you jumped off of Dallas Bay after at the beginning of the April offensive? Did you realize how exposed you were? Yes. Yes. We we didn't uh, know that until after we came down off of that. And when we hit the valley, that was the valley was just loaded with uh, and a per personnel mines. We you couldn't see them because what they do, they just chop the sod this way, pick it up and put a little mine under it and just kind of push down on it a little bit. When you're coming at it, it's just grass. When you get on the other side and look back, you can see all these chop things like that. And How, let's put it this way. How exposed were you coming off, jumping off for the April offensive? Uh, very much. Can you say it as a complete sentence? Because we couldn't tell how much uh, the Air Force had uh, neutralized the Germans. And so we, we didn't hesitate to cross some of the places that were pretty open. And that's why my, uh, my platoon got caught in there in that open space like that. And it wasn't too long after that, I think uh, Percy Rideout uh, directed us to pull back over there and go down another route to get uh, get away from the open space. And we ended up down at the bottom of the valley eventually and then worked our way up the other side. And uh, I was leading a patrol up through a ravine and I think a sniper was aiming at me because uh, the bullet cracked over, cracked the top of my head like uh, somebody hit me with a hammer like that, and it hit Peter Von Temple right here. I turned around like this, and I said, "Wow!" And he was still standing there; he hadn't even gone down yet. You'll see his name in in all of the on of our monument up on up on Tennessee Pass. He's uh, right up there with the bees. And it made me angry because Peter Von Temple was my Italian in, in translator. He's from that part of uh, New York or uh, that uh, in, where the, all the Italians knew their language. And so whenever we went someplace, I used him to tell me what was going on. So uh, that was a sad, another real sad thing, and that was part of my squad. But we moved on from there, and eventually it came down into the Pole Valley to the point where uh, we had been without green vegetables, and I was raised on vegetables. I, my, during the Depression years, my dad had a huge garden, and I, weeding them was one of my things, so I ate out of the garden. So when we hit the, everything that was green in the gardens that looked like it was edible, we ate, because uh, uh, Yellow Johnas had hit a few of the guys by that time from the lack of uh, good vegetables. And then when we finally got to the Po Valley, uh, Po River, oh, before we got to the valley, we were coming down and along this road, and um, after we had been shot at by our own Air Force, we tried to figure out what is it that we can communicate with them that it's us down here. Well, <clears throat> they said, well, they have a yellow grenade that you, uh, smoke grenade, and so we had a few of them. Well, when we hit the Pole Valley, I'm looking up one day and, oh, I watched the P-38s and the 47 dogfight over Everett when I was growing up before I went in the service. Well, here's a P-38 coming down the line and we were waving at them and, you know, like that. But all of a sudden that little front and the part was twinkling. Lights were going on. He was shooting at us. And so, he was coming right down the road where we were. We dove under a culvert, and those 50s came right down over the top of us. And it, I'm glad I was uh, <laughs> hiding in the culvert because oh, the, those things raise all kinds of heck. But not to point fingers at the uh, at what happens in war, but that's that's the way it happens. But of course, after the uh, 
the plane went by and recognized that he was shooting at his own people. The whole valley turned yellow because of the grenades, and I don't believe it was all because of the smoke grenades either. <laughs> but anyway, we got down to the Po Valley and we crossed the, uh, the river uh, on ducks. That was our first uh, experience with the ducks. And uh, uh, we made it across and uh, we approached Verona and they had a river passing through the city and they had bridges across the river and we wanted to capture those bridges. Well, they loaded us on some tanks and we all headed off to different bridges. Well, the bridge that we got to, uh, we, before we got to the, our uh, destinations, uh, we saw these explosions all along the town. <clears throat> and it turns out they blew all the bridges before we got to them. But we had the only bridge in Verona that you could still walk across. And so it was very long. I noticed that we were right along, uh, they had these concrete and, and brick things right along the river. And we were, that was where we were hiding because the Germans were on the other side. Well, be very, before very long, we had all kinds of generals up there because we had the only way to get across the river. Uh, we couldn't take any vehicles across at all. But um, it wasn't too long after that, we moved through the, that area and eventually got to Lake Garda. And we were stopped right away at the first uh, ridge that came down into the, uh, rip, into the lake and we jumped into a foxhole between the road and the lake and the Germans came right up with their machine guns right up at us and a ricochet came through the trees and hit one of the guys in the in the foxhole that we were that we jumped into and it apparently was spent enough it penetrated the helmet and dug a little groove in his scalp, and but it was already spent, and it didn't even get out the back. It just dropped down the back. That's how far it was spent. But uh, so we, uh, this was a cute little thing that happened. Not very cute. Somebody said, "Well, behind him, he's." Uh, and we were jammed in this thing like this, and they said we couldn't turn around and do anything. So the guy behind him said, "Get his first aid pack off his belt and, and put a." bandage on his head because, you know, scalpel wounds you bleed like crazy. And so uh, he opened it up, would you believe, a package of cigarettes. Somebody was trying to be nice, but he wasn't being nice at the right time. And so they had to go to the guy behind him to get his back out, and then they finally got him bandaged. And, and it was shortly after that they brought the ducks up to us. And we went all the way around those tunnels because they were either blown up or covered, so we didn't. We went up to the, I don't remember how many there were, there was there six of them, is there six tunnels? We got up to the last one, and we put in there, and it was a dead German laying right outside of the tunnel without any clothes on him. He kind of bloated, like as if something had happened. We didn't know what it was. And then we went through the tunnel, and we got to a point where something had exploded in the tunnel and there was a big pile of debris, the ceiling and stuff had come down, it was a big pile of debris, and it was dark, you could see the end of the tunnel by a little light way out in front of you. And we never did, I never did get exactly what happened. I think a, a German had an ammo truck or something in there and it blew up. It blew this other German out of the tunnel and we had to stop and wait for the Air Force to clear out in front of us before we got out to the end of the lake. And we were sitting there, and I noticed that it didn't feel like bricks I was sitting on. Well, it turned out I was sitting on a dead German. And uh, uh, so it, uh, we moved and eventually got out of that tunnel and made our way up to Riva. And I think we had a little patrol action and things into the round there. And then we got all together and started up the highway towards the Benner Pass. And we got out about a mile or two, and the, the highway in front of us was full of Germans from one side to the other with their arms in the air. The war in Italy had would ended, and we didn't know what it was. We just thought they were just giving up, but eventually the, the noise started going back and forth that the war had ended. And, and sure enough, that's what it was. And uh, then from there, we... Um, spend a little time and let sort of things catch up to us and then they trucked us from there 
all the way to the Udine, over just about 14 miles south of the Austrian border. Some of the people went over and got tangled up in the Tito uprisings. And ever, did, you, did you? No, I was sent up to Austria to climb in, in the Grossglockner area. That is really tough duty. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell me what it means to you to be, have been in the 10th Mountain Service? Does it mean a lot to you? Yes, because I believe because of that, for no other reason than I'm here. Because when I went in the service, they were training people, uh, basic training was about eight weeks. And I could have been in Guadalcanal, I could have been in North Africa. And because of that long journey, I don't believe I probably would be here. How did it, being in the 10th Mountain, shape you, who you became personally? Well, I was already uh, a mountaineer skier. And all that, I lived that way ever since I was old enough. I had an older brother that took us up and trained us, uh, taught us, and climbed with us. And, and uh, so uh, to me, it was almost like a resort when I was in Camp Hale. It, I really enjoyed the thing. And um, uh, it, it uh, gave me a different outlook on life for sure. In what way? And gosh, it's kind of hard to describe that one. Uh, like I say, I keep falling back. I was in the right place at the right time. And, and you can see that fits what I was just saying. Being in the 10th mountain kept me out of a lot of other terrible places in the world. And, and, uh, and it brought together a group of people. That I, most of my education in my life was by listening and observing. And, and uh, I was amazed that I was in such a highly educated group of people that couldn't tell me which state was on top of each other on the West Coast. And I could name everything on the, on the, West, on the East Coast and name the rivers and the mountains and what have you. And it always amazed me that uh, people that were doctors, attorneys, business people, that was their focus. And they didn't know what was going on out here. And so, <laughs> but I, I loved I loved the whole bunch of them, and uh, I could tell by their brogue after a while uh, where they came from. I used guys from Chicago and 